I'm excited to introduce to you our, our next speaker who's going to come to us virtually, uh, Chris Grison. All right. You know, I didn't say much about Father Hage when I introduced him. He played a lot of hockey growing up, won the state high school championship as, as a high school hockey player. But you know what guys who can ice skate do? They play football. All right, Chris, wherever you are in Wisconsin, I hope you're laughing at me right now. I, I had not heard of, of Chris Grison, but I reached out to a priest I know who's a good friend of his, Father Quinn Mann about some resources, contacts he might have. And he said, I got a great guy. He's an awesome family man, NFL quarterback, led his college team to a national championship. He's a great leader, convert to the faith, primarily through his wife, Shannon. He teaches at Green Bay Catholic High School. Uh, he's a great speaker. I replied to this wonderful glowing email and said, that's great. What other men's conferences has he spoke at? None, you'd be the first. <laughs> so. I love you so confident in you, in Chris, uh, that you'd be able to do this. But I thought about it later. You've been leading quarterback camps, right? You've been, been and reaching out to, to young men, to fathers, to, to the individuals, the, the, the guys that you're mentoring and improving their skills. You've been giving talks for a long, long time. But just in case you weren't ready, we gave you a red shirt year. So you had all of last year when we canceled to, to work on this talk. So we're pretty excited to, to welcome Chris Grison from Wisconsin. And give us a second to get the technology switched, and he will be on your screens. Good morning, can you hear me? I guess I can't see anyone. Uh, hopefully uh, you guys uh, are hearing me and I wanna say good morning and welcome. Um, my name is Chris Grison and I'm very humbled to, um, to be here today. I, I wish, as we all do, wish we were together in community and being able to talk uh, together and be able to look uh, in your eyes and to your face and uh, and be able to see um, and be able to see you guys face to face. So, um, but I cherish this opportunity to be able to share my story a little bit um, uh, and, and be able to talk to you today. So, my title, and I'm going to go back and forth and sharing my screen. Uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm going to go back and forth a little bit from um, from me being here. Um, I'm in Milwaukee. I'm actually. Uh, we have a funeral for uh, my wife's uh, great aunt who is 99 and we're going to celebrate her life today and so uh, we're on our way there so I'm down in Milwaukee but normally in Green Bay so but I'll be back and forth sharing my screen uh, with you so I'm going to share it right now and so you can see this and there I believe you can see it now um, and so I'm going to expand this out so you can see it so the, my presentation is called Who Am I, really? And that, that doesn't mean who am I, like me as a person, Chris Grison, but it is who are you, okay? So that's a question that you should ask yourself, okay? And so, our, you know, we're looking at taking refuge in the Lord and how can we take a re refuge in the Lord as a Christian in this secular Lord world today, okay? So, a little bit about myself, um, Father just introduced me, so thank you, Father, for that. Um, but a little bit more, I, I did, I grew up a Lutheran. Uh, my mom and brother uh, and I always went to church. My dad didn't uh, go to church at all, or he hardly ever did on Christmas and Easter. Um, I ended up going off to college. I did play football. I got a Division II scholarship. We won the national championship. It was wonderful. I decided during that time frame, uh, I was engaged to my wife that I was going to become Catholic, uh, Lutheran, Catholicism, very similar. Um, and I would tell you during that RCIA program, I, I wasn't necessarily very well catechized. And so um, I, I would say we, I was very much a cafeteria Catholic, if you know what that means. I kind of picked and choose what I wanted to believe. And my wife, who was um, a cradle Catholic, she too would admit that uh, she was not catechized real well. But we ended up, um, I got drafted into the NFL, graduated, got married. It was wonderful. I ended up playing 14 years of professional football, not all in the NFL, but I was able to travel around the world playing this great game. After that, I retired. I started up my court, a quarterback academy. So you can see all these different pictures. Man, I got Chris Grice at Quarterback Academy. You see me with the Dallas Cowboys, the Arizona Cardinals. I started up my own um, seven on seven football tournament, all this stuff. And now I know uh, father introduced me as a, 
a teacher at a Catholic school. I ended up taking a, 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 another job recently, becoming the head football coach at West De Pere High School. Uh, they're a suburb of Green Bay. So th that's kind of a, a little bit about me. But what I'm most proud of is this right here, my family. Uh, my wife and I, Shannon, we've been married together for 21 years. We have nine children. And I'm sure some of you are looking at this and, and thinking, I only see six kids. Well, our first three children are up in heaven. We had three miscarriages. And uh, we have Grace, James, and Mary up in heaven, um, always uh, praying to them and to intercede for their dad down here in heaven and their family. But these are the children that God blessed us with here on earth. And my two oldest daughters, Michaela in the center, Hannah on the right, and then my two sons, Patrick on the left, Andrew sitting down, and then my two little girls, I got Catherine and Margaret. And so this is the, the pride of my life, man. It's, it's awesome. There's uh, always something going on at the Grison household. Now, with this presentation, and because I'm a coach, I, I feel like I have to consistently try to strive, and as a teacher, strive to get people to be better. And so I'm going to challenge you today, and I, I use this analogy all the time, whether it's in my classroom or certainly in the weight room, is that you cannot get better, you cannot get stronger if you don't add some perseverance, if you are not challenged. You have to be challenged in life, otherwise you cannot persevere and get stronger. So for instance, if I'm going to try to get, uh, get my football players stronger using the squat bar, okay, where they're going to squat down. Well, I actually, they can't just go up and down squatting. That might get them somewhat stronger, but not really, right? They'll, they'll, they'll get somewhat stronger to a certain point. But when you want to get stronger, you have to put weight on the bar. You have to challenge yourself. And so today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to challenge some of you. Now, I will tell you this, first off. We are all, all of us are on a different journey. We're on a different path of our journey. And I'm certainly on the journey still too. And I, am, I tell you, I'm no different than you guys today. Uh, I'm, I'm on this journey and still working on things. And so I don't want to ever come across as being this super pious guy. Like I still struggle with sin, always do. Seems like every time I go to confession, I'm, saying the same sins. <laughs> but I want you to understand that we can challenge each other, you know, iron sharpens iron type deal. And so that's what I'm going to do today and ask certain questions to make you ponder and to make you think. So these question is this, who am I? A number of years ago, I was, um, I just retired from the National Football League and from playing professional football, like I mentioned, it was 14 years. And if you add in college there, that's 19 years. And then you think high school and middle school. I've been playing football for 25 years. And I will say this humbly, I, I, I was pretty good at it. And so I, I ended up you know, going to this retreat. And it was a silent retreat, but during one of the sessions where uh, a pastor or priest was guiding us, he, he talked about identity. And during that time, I was struggling a little bit with my identity, being that I, I just retired. And for those 25 years, football was a major part of my life. And now it was gone. I was no longer a player. And the funny thing is, is like, you look at NFL football players today. My brother, who uh, is three years younger than me, played eight years in the National Football League, and I remember he really struggled for three years, almost, almost into a depression state to where what he didn't know what to do. He didn't know who he was because for so long as football players in professional football or anything, it could be any walk of life, you identify yourself as what you do, not who you truly are. And so this priest asked a question, who am I? And not just him, but for us to ask, who am I? And that's why for you guys, 
I want you to ask that question about yourself. Who am I? And just real briefly, for one minute, because we don't have a whole lot of time today, but for one minute, I want you to either write it, something down, if you have a pencil or pen and paper, or just in your mind, I want you to go through and answer this question by saying these I am statements. I am this. I am this. And put it, try to put it in order. From the greatest importance, the greatest identity, how you identify yourself down to the least. So I will give you a minute. Again, write it down as I am. Give you one minute and go. Okay, I'll give you 10 more seconds. Okay, stop. So one quote that struck me as I was doing research for this talk was a quote by St. John Paul II, this is on World Youth Day, 1993. He said, you are not who they say you are. Let me remind you of who you are. Again, about identity, because certainly our secular culture wants to tell us how we should be, what we are, especially young kids. Think about the confusion with even gender ideology. I mean, kids don't even know anymore if they're boys or girls, right? That they've confused so many people. That's what secular world today is doing. So here's St. John Paul II going to World Youth Day saying, you are not who they say you are. Let me remind you of who you are. And oftentimes as men, especially men, we get confused. I read a book. It was a great book called The Season of Life. It was actually about a guy named Joe Ehrman, which many of you might know or have heard of. Joe Ehrman was a great uh, Syracuse Orangeman, All-American defensive lineman, has done so many great things. I read his book and it changed my life. But one of the things Joe talks about is the lies of masculinity. These three lies of, number one, the lie of athletic success determines what kind of man you are. And we learned this when we were younger, like in grade school. If you could kick the kickball the furthest or hit the hanging curveball, like you're a bigger and better man if you can do that. And that's a lie. Just because I played 14 years of professional football doesn't mean I am a better man than all of you sitting there, either, either at your home or at the church or wherever. The second lie is sexual conquest. I, I learned this, you know, watching my fellow teammates in college and, you know, later in the pros that all of a sudden they thought they were a bigger and better man because they were able to get all these women around them or they were able to exploit them sexually. Like that's a lie. But our world says that's pretty cool. Will Chamberlain wrote a book about how he slept with 10,000 people or 10,000 girls. I mean, that's horrible, but a lot of people glorify him because of that. And something that a third lie that Joe talked about was the lie of economic success. Just because I have more toys, a boat, a cottage or whatever, doesn't make me a bigger and better man. It doesn't at all, but that's a lie. And we start competing as men. So we have to be known, we have to be reminded of who we are as our, in our identity as fathers, or sorry, as sons of God. 
And so when I went through my list, that was the first thing I put. I put here my, let's see if I get this up. Sorry here, guys. I'm having technical difficulties here. Oh, here we go. Sorry. I'll go back. But the right here is, I am a son of God. That's the first thing I identified myself with when I started thinking about this at the retreat. I am a son of God. Now, everything is funny. When I started thinking about this, and I really, when you think about this, think about yourself as a, as a young child. Like here you see this young boy praying. I don't care if you are 70 years old or if you're here at this conference at 20 years old. Think of yourself as this little boy. I had the opportunity to hold one of my young sons a number of years back, and I remember he was just really being ornery. And he, was, he ended up falling asleep in my lap. And I was holding him after this bad day where he was just being sassy and he wasn't listening. And I was just holding him. And I started thinking, man, how much I love him. And then I thought, holy cow, that's how I am to God. God just loves holding me. Even though I do all these things, I disobey his commandments. I treat people poorly. I don't do what he says. I don't talk to him enough, but yet he holds me and just loves me infinitely more than I could love my son at that moment. I always think of this quote by St. Augustine. St. Augustine would say this, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts will be restless until it rests in thee. Guys, this is what we have to do. We have to rest in the Lord. We have to put all of our trust, kind of like a son, like this young boy pictured here, being able to put ourselves in the Lord's lap and take refuge in him. A scripture verse from Matthew chapter 18 says this, He called the child over, placed it in their midst, and said, Amen, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Gentlemen, look at this picture of this young boy. This is you. This is me. I don't care if you're 70 or 20. If you're stressed, picture yourself as this young boy putting yourself in the arms of God the Father. And he will take care of you. The next way, the next I am statement I put, I am a Christian. I am a Christian. What does this mean that I am a Christian? A lot of people say that I am a Christian. Well, it means I am a follower of Jesus Christ. The question is, are you a follower? Or do you just say it? No, again, I don't. I say this to myself as much as I say it to you because I have to challenge myself daily. A disciple of Jesus Christ is someone who walks. Look how close these men are walking behind Jesus. They experience everything that he did. Are we willing to experience that same thing? When I was putting this together, I was thinking about the Bible verse from Galatians 2, Galatians 2, 19 through 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, yet I live no longer I, but Christ lives in me. Does Christ live within you? When people see you, do they see Jesus Christ? Do they see joy and love? I mean, people, when they're around Jesus Christ, they were, they were just like in awe. 
And he wasn't anything special, but he just, he had love emanating from him. Mother Teresa, people would go visit Mother Teresa and they just like, they would just start crying because she had so much love. Guys, this is what we need. We need more Christian men. And you just being at this conference is a great start. Because you said, I am willing to be challenged today. I am willing to learn how to become a better Christian, a better disciple of Jesus Christ. The next one, I am Catholic. As I mentioned before, I grew up um, Lutheran. And I was also, after I got confirmed and took my first Eucharist, I would say that and admit I was very cafeteria Catholic. I now wholly believe in everything the Catholic Church teaches. Like when I sit at, the, at Mass, and after we hear the Gospel reading, we say the prayers, and then we say together the Nicene Creed, and we say in there, I believe in one holy Catholic Church or apostolic church. I actually get a little bit louder during that part. I do. I truly believe everything the church teaches. Why? Number one, through God's grace. And number two is being able to go to things like this. I'm going to mention a bunch of different ways that I was able to be transformed. But doing things like this, being at a conference like this, listening to the speakers, great speakers, like Father Jason, and later you listen to one of the best speakers ever, Steve Ray, in my opinion, my humble opinion. Okay? But the question that you have to ask yourself, do you believe everything the Catholic Church teaches? Because for, for a long time, I didn't believe the doctrine and the belief that contraception was bad. Didn't believe it. I believed in everything else, but... Just like, ah, oh, well, man, I, I think I sh should be able to choose when I have children, when I don't, and all that kind of stuff. I actually had a longtime Catholic tell me it was okay. But then all of a sudden I learned. The funny thing was that I actually got, I will tell you this, and I will be very transparent and honest with you guys. I was living in a secular world, secular world, just like you guys are, and I ended up getting a vasectomy. And then I learned the truth. And through God's grace and my sister-in-law, who helped me find a doctor that would relatively cheaply, comparatively to what I was would have to pay at home, had it reversed. And the picture of those two little girls that you saw, my Margaret and Catherine, well, they came after the reversal. Praise the Lord. I look at those two little girls and I smile and say, thank you, God, for teaching me how to be truly Catholic. St. Augustine said this, and again, I'll quote St. Augustine. If you believe what you like in the Gospels and reject what you don't like, it is not the Gospel you believe, but yourself. Let me read this again. Again, this is very, very challenging. And again, just internalize it. Because for me, for again, when I was cafeteria Catholic, I believed that I knew more than St. John Paul II. I knew more than St. Augustine. I knew more than Thomas Aquinas, which is laughable because I'm not close as smart as those gentlemen. St. Augustine said this, if you believe what you like in the Gospels and reject what you don't like, it is not the gospel you believe, but yourself. Guys, this is, if you don't believe everything in the Catholic Church, I'm not saying that you have to believe it right now, but I'm asking you, go study. Go learn more about it. Ask your priest. Talk to someone. Listen to CDs. Again, I know I'm loading on the weights here. I'm challenging you, but go check it out and see why. Next, 
I am an American. I think about the greatest generation. I, I put this in here because you know what? I think about if, if I were of age, I'm 44 now, but if I were 20 years old and I, or even younger, say 20, 17, like my father, uh, my uh, grandfather on my wife's side, who enlisted at 17 years old, he lied so that he could go fight in World War II. The greatest generation, my grandparents' generation. Would I be willing to sacrifice for my country, for freedoms, the freedom of religion and the freedom of speech and all that stuff? And I said, absolutely. This is what we have to be willing to do now because you look at what our, has happened to our country and the different ideologies that are trying to take over. Okay, It is important that we are all Americans. The next one is I'm a husband. I had to, I had to really think hard and really be taught what it was to be a husband. Just like father said before, father Jason talked about fatherhood and we'll talk about that next, but I had to figure out what it means to be a husband. And I, it wasn't, it didn't become natural, that's for sure. But when I started realizing, when I heard that becoming a husband, a great way, a great representation of what it means to be a husband is look at Jesus Christ on the crucifix. That is what a husband is all about. Is being able to be willing to sacrifice and die for my bride. You can see my bride there, that's Shannon. We dated for eight years before we ended up getting married. So we've been together for 29 years. And I'm finally, finally starting to realize what, how I need to truly love her. And I have to be willing to be like Christ. I think about Ephesians chapter five. And of course, this is a very controversial verse in the, in the church and Christianity, because Paul, who he's writing to the Ephesians, uh, he says this, he says, be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives should be subordinate to their husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of his wife, just as Christ is head of the church. He himself, the savior of the body. As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husbands in everything. And of course, you know, I always like to smile a little bit. When I do it, I know you can't see my face right now, but you know, when you read that, sometimes, you know, guys, especially when you hear it in church, you know, we, we, we like, yeah, that's right. You should be subordinate to me. Oftentimes though, and, and women get upset because what? I have to be subordinate to my husband. What do you mean? I thought we we're equals, right? Well, yes, but no equal in dignity, but different roles. Because here it is, the wives should be subordinate to their husbands, but yet now let's read on. We have to listen closely. Paul goes on to write, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over to her. Let me read that again. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Here we're celebrating Joseph. And I know Father Jason talked about Joseph and Steve. We will talk about Joseph here in a little bit. But what a great role model of St. Joseph being willing to die. Christ hadn't even died on the cross yet, but he was willing to die for his bride, Mary, and his foster son, Jesus. Guys, I'll never forget when I learned this and I was tested right away. Because, you know, I, growing up in Green Bay... I, I, my grandfather played for the Green Bay Packers, huge Packer fan. And this is before DVR, guys, before you could pause it and record it and all that kind of stuff. I'm sitting watching the Packer game, and my youngest or oldest daughter was young then. She's taking a bath. And my wife had to go do something real quickly. So she calls me and says, Chris, Chris, can you come up here quickly and watch Michaela in the bathtub? 
And this is in the middle of the Packer game. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, no, I, I'm going to miss the Packer game. See, dying to oneself for a wife doesn't mean just one time I'm going to push my wife out of an oncoming bus and end up dying for her. This is something for us to do daily is to be willing to die and sacrifice our own wants and needs for our bride. That's what it means to be a great husband. Next, I am a father. You can see all my kids. Look at those two little girls. You think they're a little sassy? You think I'm going to be in trouble when they grow up? Heck yeah. Holy man, they are something else. But what beautiful kids. And as you can tell, these kids look like my wife. Thank goodness. But I am a father. And here you have to realize, guys, as a father, whether it's a father of, you know, biological kids or adopted, our number one job is to get our children to heaven. First and foremost, it's not to get them a great education, as, well, as good as that is. I'm a teacher. But it's not to get them a great education, not to get them a scholarship, a nice car. Our job as fathers is to get our children to heaven. And, and as Father Chase said at the end of his talk, I was listening, I was like, wow, what a talk on St. Joseph. He said, where are the fathers? Where are the fathers today? Guys, I was doing a little research. The Washington Post uh, opinion columnist, George Will, in 19, you know, talked about this. In 1965, Daniel Monahan, who was the Assistant Secretary of Labor, reported that 23.6% of black children born, or to, uh, born were born to single mothers. Again, 23.6% of black children were born to single mothers. 3% of white children were born to single mothers. Today, today, looking it up, about 71% of black children, 71%, almost three in four black children are born to single mothers. 53% of Hispanic children are born to single mothers. And together, collectively, white, Hispanic, black, 40% of all children are born to single mothers. There is a crisis in fatherhood today. I love what Father Jason said. Fathers are not born. Fatherhood is a decision and has to be made. And I think one of the things I'm looking at my two sons there, I have to teach them through my words, but more importantly, through my modeling of good fatherhood so that they know how to become good fathers someday. Now, I could keep on going down the list. I am a son. I am a brother. I am a friend. I'm a teacher. I'm a coach. And I am, I am, I am. And just like you, you could go down the list from there. But the question now is, what do we do? How do, how do we become and live a Christian life in the secular world? Number one, keep your eye on the goal. Just like as I tell my, my athletes, like we sat down at the end of the season last year, and we made our goals right away. And I will remind them of their, our goals that they actually created. And so you have to remember your goal. What is the goal of this life? Well, remember, we are not here. This is not the end. We are on a pilgrimage here on earth to get home to heaven. As it says in Mark 8, 36, what profit is there for one to gain the whole world and then forfeit his life. I mean, you could have all the possessions you wanted in the world. You could have all the fame that you wanted, all the money you wanted in this world. But if you don't go to heaven, it's all over. The number one goal is to get to heaven. Become a saint. There is nothing else you should want. I mean, I shouldn't say nothing else you want, but that's the highest goal certainly have other goals in life. We should have other goals. I want to win a state championship for my kids in my school. But that's not going to go in front of becoming a saint. I always tell my kids my, that I'm coaching, either you're getting better or you're getting worse. You never stay the same. Again, let me say that again. 
either you're getting better or you're getting worse, you're never staying the same. So you're either getting closer to heaven or farther away from heaven. You never stay the same. So how do you continue to get better or how do you continue to get closer to heaven? Number one, you have to pray. I know that that sounds so easy, right? Like everyone says pray, but it's the truth. What's your prayer life like? How often do you talk to God? Guys, I started this year uh, to become consecrated to St. Joseph, and I'm learning more and more about him, and I can't, I'm excited that you get to continue to hear after Father Jason's presentation, you get to hear Steve Ray talk about St. Joseph. Learn more about him. I'm learning, uh, reading Father Calloway's book about consecration. And just being able to pray to him, my spiritual father. So make sure you do that. Read the Bible. Go to morning mass as much as you can. Obviously, Sunday or Sunday obligation. Okay? Go to confession. Also, listen. Listen to on the, on the radio, relevant radio. I don't know if you have that out here um, or out in Syracuse, but we have it in Green Bay, and I know it's pretty much nationwide now, but certainly EWTN and guys at CDs or, or MP3s, whatever you can, get a hold of them. Stephen Ray was one of the big changers of my life. I listen to his talks all the time. What a tremendous, tremendous man and speaker he is. And then do Bible studies if you can. Okay. And I know I'm running a little bit behind, so I'm going to move on. Number two, be willing to be a martyr. Be countercultural. How do you live a Christian life in the secular world? Be willing to be martyred. Guys, we have to be willing to be martyrs. Be witnesses to the truth. Think about Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You look at our culture today. I wouldn't say it's becoming more Christian. I think we'd all agree with that. I mean, considering that, what, 70, almost 70% 70 of people identify as Christians, but yet abortion is legal. Euthanasia is legal. We are now allowing boys to play in girls' sports. I mean, is this a Christian country? Really? But we have to be willing to change that. And how do we change it? We'll look to the early church. Christians were willing to be countercultural, even to the point of death and being martyred. If you want to study it, study the early church. It's amazing. And as Jesus says, if the world hates you, realize that it hated him first. Again, look into the apostles and the great saints and how they were martyred. Okay? Next, number three, always seek the truth. Seek it. Seek the truth with everything you do. Read, listen to CDs. This is, again, how you will become a better Christian, how you will become a better Catholic. As John says in uh, 14, uh, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Educate yourself. I love this quote from uh, Bishop Archbishop Fulton Sheen. He says, there are not a hundred people in America who hate the Catholic Church. There are millions of people who hate what they wrongly believe to be the Catholic Church, which is, of course, quite different. Again, learn, be able to talk about the church and what it truly means and what it teaches so that we can always, because we can't give, guys, what you don't have. You cannot give the truth to people. You can't share the truth if you first don't have it within you. So seek the truth in everything you do. And then once you do have the truth, always speak the truth with love. Now, this is a big misnomer because I was just actually funny talking with uh, one of my students at West Appear, which is a public high school. And this girl was going through some hard times with a boyfriend. And we were talking about love and how there's four. Actually, I'm not going to go through them, but there's four words in the Greek language that, uh, that define love here in America. In English, we only have one word, and so we get confused. But what is love? Well, St. Augustine, again, willing the good of the other as other, or wanting what's best for the other person. That's what love is. 
I love St. John Paul II's self-donation. How wonderful of definitions those are. Always speak in love. Because here's the thing. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if I speak in human and angelic tongues and you do not have love, I'm a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and comprehend all mysteries and knowledge, if I have all faith so as to move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Guys, you might have all the words and all the everything, all the knowledge of the Christian faith, but if we don't have love, if we don't speak with love, it will be nothing. This is how we're going to bring back our Christian culture in this secular world. And so what do you do now? And I mentioned before, read the Bible, get to know the catechism, listen to CDs, all these great speakers that influenced me, Matthew Kelly, Father Larry Richards, Dr. Brand Petrie, Scott Hahn, Stephen Ray. On the internet, there's blogs, daily emails, sermons, videos, podcasts, all these great speakers, books, pamphlets. And of course, number six, retreats and conferences. What you're doing right now is you are getting better. You're not getting worse. You're becoming closer to heaven by doing things like this. So gentlemen, I would like to end in prayer. And it's a prayer that I just learned out of Father Calloway's book. We all, I'm sure, know the Memorare to Mary. And so I'd like to pray with all of you the Memorare to, to St. Joseph. And it says this, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Beforehand, I'd like you to think of an intention. Because oftentimes when we say the Memorare, we don't say it with an intention. But I want you to think of an intention whether it's for yourself, your wife, your family, kids, maybe someone sick. Think of an intention before we pray this. And we pray. Remember, O most chaste spouse of the Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who implored thy help or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O chaste husband of Mary. To thee do we come before thee we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O guardian of the Redeemer, despise not our petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer us. Amen. Gentlemen, uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, may God bless all of you and your families. Um, on this day and in the future. And um, I'm so excited for you and on your journey um, as Christian men, as Catholic men, um, you know, changing this world around to be a Christian again. So thank you to all the people working backstage, uh, making this happen, especially allowing me to be here um, and, uh, and speaking virtually with you today. So thank you. God bless you.